According to Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, an independent civil society organization that keeps track of crime rates across the globe. Crime rates are rising globally, but resilience measures are not keeping pace with the increasing threats of danger and insecurity across the African continent. According to the research, a country's capacity to address economic crisis and social fragmentation in the nation is slim due to issues with elected officials' integrity and growing government repression. Now, the results of the 2023 uh, index uh, demonstrate that uh, complete democracies continue to be more resilient to organized crime than authoritarian uh, governments. Uh, here's what the index, of course, looks like. You can see that on your screen. Uh, the Global Organized Crime Index 2023 from Myanmar to Colombia, Mexico, Paraguay, Congo Democratic Republic, Nigeria comes in at sixth, South Africa at seventh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon. Um, well, not very interesting position to find uh, these two countries, the giant of Africa and, you know, your sister country, South Africa there. But joining us this morning is uh, Wale Ojewale. He's uh, an expert in conflicts, organized crime and security governance here in West Africa. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mr. Ojewale. Thank you so much for having me. All right. We're also joined by, uh, or via phone rather, from Katsina State, Dr. Kingsley Madweke. Uh, he is, of course, the Nigeria Research Coordinator, Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. He's also a lecturer, a lecturer rather, at the Center for Conflict Management and Peace Studies, University of Jos. Good morning, Dr. Kingsley. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, All right. I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Ojiwali. Um It's not a not a pretty picture there. You know, we're talking about organized crime. 2023. You know, when you hear words like that, you probably will be thinking about you know, the 70s and the mafia in the, in the, you know, in the 60s. But it's 2023. Nigeria, of course, is still sitting very comfortably, in, you know, on that list. Um, South Africa also. But, you know, paint a picture of what this means, you know, that we're, you know, that Nigeria is found on that list and not found in a, in a very, you know, nice place. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm very excited to be here because my organization, uh, Institute for Security Studies, through our NACT program on organized crime, is actually part of this report that you are citing and is excited to provide additional education to the general public. So anybody that has been following development in Nigeria for the past, let's say, 10 years now, should rightly agree that the indicators that were used are always with us um, to measure how we have been able to respond or manage organized crime. And I will give you just two examples. Um, for about a decade or more now, the cry in Nigeria, the conversation, even from the authorities like NNPC, is that um, our daily output has dropped significantly as a result of oil theft in the Niger Delta. That is in thousands of barrels, um, according to all available reports, which I believe even your platform has talked about significantly over, over time. So that is a major organized crime that is going on in the Niger Delta, oil theft. The second one is the sheer scale of kidnapping for ransom in Nigeria, which are element of organized crime anyway. So when you put all these things together with other arrays of issues like arms trafficking, human trafficking, uh, or smuggling, or whatever you call it, the sheer scale of corruption in Nigeria, which are issues of organized crime. Um, I think uh, they are daily realities that most Nigerians can attest to. In fact, most people believe that uh, the major challenge that Nigeria is facing is the issue of corruption. That if we are able to eliminate corruption significantly, that we might be able to do better on human development indicators. So these are realities of organized crime that are daily, I mean, that, are, that we are living in in Nigeria, that we are coping with, that we are trying to manage. And compared to the Republic of Congo, that is also sharing almost similar number with Nigeria, I think five and six, if I get it correctly, um, or even South Africa that you mentioned. There's a report about South Africa recently that more people die daily in South Africa as a result of gun violence or uh, homicide than people that are killed even in war front in, in Ukraine. And when you look at Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of Congo that I mentioned, there's a common denominator. We are both 
overtly relying on the extractive sector. And this is where the organized crime is taking place. This is where the corruption is taking place. And so I, I think the number is actually well placed, judging by our daily realities. All right, now let's bring in Dr. Kingsley Madweke. You are the Nigeria Research Coordinator for Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Let's want you to talk to us about the, I mean, we, we've had uh, Mr. Ojewale give us a background as to the areas and the factors and the indices to consider when looking at corruption in Nigeria. But I want you to give us a fuller picture as to what were some of the metrics that were used in reaching this decision and finding Nigeria at number six on the list. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Oli. And um, ju just to give you a sense of the uh, metrics, I, I would latch to, I, I would just like to um, give a very brief background uh, of the index and then, of course, touch on the methodology. And um, I'll try my best not to be technical, uh, but to put it in a way that um, uh, the ordinary person on the street can make sense of it. Um, so the Global Crime, Organized Crime Index, is, um, is the, one of uh, the major projects of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. And um, it is a very sophisticated and uh, multidimensional tool. Uh, and the key objective is, of course, to assess the level of criminality and resilience to organize crime for 193 countries along three key pillars. Now, I, I just have to pause here and emphasize that the index does not only uh, assess uh, criminality, it also assess resilience uh, to this uh, criminality. So it's important to uh, drive that point and make it very clear. And the index also importantly um, is developed over a two-year period. And uh, so for this particular version of the index, uh, it speaks to criminal activity essentially in 2022. So even though we're launching it in 2023, it was launched just uh, within the week, uh, but it speaks to criminal activity. The assessment is based on data collected in 2022. So it is very important to also make that uh, point. Uh, the tool is on the pin, um, just to speak about the rigor of it. Uh, it's on the pin by over 400 expert assessment and evaluation uh, by uh, by the different and also inputs from the different regional observatories of the global initiative. So uh, the objective essentially is to provide a metrics-based information uh, that will support policymakers, uh, continental and regional bodies, and national governments to help them prioritize uh, their intervention. Because one of the key problems about um, responding to organized crime is the mismatch between response strategy and uh, the, the dynamics of these criminal activities and criminal actors engaged in different illicit economies. It's this mismatch. So um, this index, uh, a key objective is to actually kind of provide an evidence base uh, for authority to make more informed uh, policies and intervention programs to organize crime. So um, the index measures criminality and resilience on a scale of 1 to 10. So I just want people out there to know that when I mention 8.0, for example, for a particular uh, criminal activity or organized crime, what I mean is 8 over 10. So the higher the number, or the closer the number to the, to the digit number 10, it means the most is there, that particular criminal activity there. So I, this is just to give a background, and then, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm open to other questions. Thank you very much, Ronnie. 
I'm faulting, you know, from from your analysis and you know, you know what you've also been able to explain. But um, I'm going to bring in um, Mr. Ojewole once again. Uh, we, we of course have a new government. Uh, it has been stated um, by, of course, uh, Kingsley Madueke that the ratings are from 2022. But of course, we're in 2023. Elections have happened in Nigeria. Um, do you have any confidence? in Nigeria's new government to be able to fix these issues that have been pointed out. And we're talking organized crime. I mean, earlier in the day, we spoke about, I mean, in the, news, in the newspapers not very long ago, 191 people killed by the, the army. And it, it's, 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 it's how easy it is to just see that in the news, that the Nigeria's, uh, Nigeria's army, you know, you know, killed 191 terrorists or bandits or whichever they are. Casually, 191 people. And so... We have a new government. Do you have any faith that we can maybe, you know, get taken out of the top 10 in, in these um, indexes in the next couple of years? Yes, I think so. I think uh, things are expectedly to improve in the coming days, particularly looking at the electoral promises that this government seeks to deliver. And I think they are combining all the different approaches to engage with relevant stakeholders to be able to bring this to the barest minimum. I'll give an example about oil theft in the Niger Delta. I think uh, the president is trying to use the unconventional means um, to possibly see how that can be reduced by probably talking to the militants, maybe a, a, a mild revision of the harmless program, amnesty program that we've seen in the past. And then and there are also electoral promises about resourcing the security and law enforcement agencies to be able to respond to uh, internal crime and even organized crime in the country. Although so far so good, I don't think things have actually improved, uh, but we can only give the government some time um, to see how we can see some incremental changes in all these issues. What is strong on the table is the issue of corruption. Um, I have not seen that. If you look at the, um, the re I mean, issues in the last three or five months, uh, we've seen a situation in which uh, a few individuals who served in the, pro um, in the previous government have been arrested and probably been um, interrogated by the law enforcement and security agencies in the country now. So the question is, are we also going to see a repetition of corruption at that large scale in the current administration, or are we going to see a commitment to fight uh, corruption in the country, which is an element, a major element of organized crime like I, 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 I highlighted originally. So, and coupled with the fact that the government will also need to use other non-kinetic or non-security um, strategies to be able to address issues of crime in Nigeria. And since this speaks to the issue of socioeconomic development, the rising unemployment, the youth bulge, these are issues that are very, very critical in driving or enabling, I mean, in enabling any form of crime in the country. So these are some of the things that I hope in the coming days we should be able to see decisive action on the part of the government. But to judge by what they've done so far, um, I think um, I will just maintain some form of modest optimism and hoping that things are not going to be business as usual. But um, these are realities that are still with us as we are talking bandits are still kidnapping people in the northwest in fact there's kidnapping all over the country and then nigeria has not yet reached what it was to um, about 10 years ago in terms of daily oil production of 2.2 million barrels per day so to the extent to which we still have these challenges um, staring us in the face we can only keep some modest optimism that things are going to improve in the days to come based on the electoral promises of the current administration all right, I'd also like us to now also speak with Dr. Kingsley Madweke. From your research, what are some of the immediate measures that would need to be taken? I don't know if you have some um, data on some of the immediate measures that would need to be taken if Nigeria's rating on the index is going, is going to have to improve. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, so, um, of course, there's a range of... Um, uh, actions, uh, and by actions I mean um, essentially I'm not speaking about uh, securitized measures, which uh, we know the Nigerian government and uh, several African countries, and I mean even outside Africa, have been obsessed with. Um, I think 
uh, a major, major problem, which I hinted uh, earlier, is that um, there's need, for example, to understand in a very granular manner uh, the dynamics of organized crime and then design responses uh, that actually attack or tackle the problem uh, from its very root. Now, I'm saying this because uh, the extensive research, especially within Nigeria, that we have conducted, one of the findings that come across, that comes across very strongly, is this mismatch between response strategies and uh, the organized crime. So there's this obsession with securitized measures, kinetic measures. And sometimes we have seen these measures turn even counterproductive. So I I will give you an example. Um, After the ban on rice importation and water, this is a very small uh, example, but it gives you a sense of the mismatch I'm talking about. Um, communities in the southwest, border towns in the southwest, especially around Ogun State, and then also communities in Katsina, around GPR local government, uh, where a lot of rice smuggling was taking place. Um, what the government did in response was to arm uh, immigration officers and customs officers to go after the smugglers. Now, of course, the smuggling is illegal, but then you have to think of the implication because what it did was it essentially changed a criminal activity that was nonviolent to become violent. So we saw a situation where in retaliation, the smugglers armed themselves and started also attacking uh, immigration officers and customs officers in these border towns. And I'm just saying this uh, to emphasize that several responses that the Nigerian government has engaged have actually been counterproductive because there's this mismatch between the responses and the criminal activity. Now, coming to the Northwest, of Nigeria, where you have the armed banditry crisis, which a long-running crisis from 2011. And the problem was this issue wasn't responded to until it became a crisis. And we have seen this happen over and over. So a very good starting point for Nigerian authorities is to identify problems early enough and respond to them before they blow up into crisis situations. Because the only thing you can do in a crisis situation is to manage it. You you cannot tackle a crisis. You have to manage the crisis to a minimal level before you are even able to respond to it in a comprehensive manner. So essentially what we're doing now across Nigeria, whether it's in the Northeast, whether it's in the Northwest, in central Nigeria, I mean, we've had killings in Plateau State uh, related to organized crime, and we've also had killings in Benue, I mean, throughout the Benue Valley related to organized crime. And we don't even have to mention the Northwest. We don't even have to mention the Southeast. But what we have seen across the board, a common denominator, has been the sidestepping of the major issues. So authorities accept the major issues and implement these securitized measures and imagine that they will address the root causes. So I think um, this need for in-depth reflection on the side of the Nigerian authorities and to also engage with reports, uh, reports like the Organized Crime Index, and have a deeper sense of the understanding of these dynamics and then respond in a context-specific manner to address these issues. Thank you very much. Dr. Kingsley Madwiki, very interesting um, uh, points have been made there. Um, Mr. Joel, I'm going to, you know, wrap up with you. Um, we, of course, you know, have observed over time that there's still 
Um, Nigeria, of course, is still a very, very, you know, large smuggling route for uh, cartels in different parts of the continent, you know, and even, you know, through Europe. Um, and we're talking drugs and fish and gold and ammunition and, and um, endangered, um, you know, animals and whatnot. You know, Nigeria continues to be that place. Um, we can make demands um, to, you know, reduce corruption. Maybe that's what will help. We can also make demands, you know, that the government does better, you know, with regards to its security infrastructure. But um, do we do we believe that we genuinely have the infrastructure that is enough to fight these levels of crime? If we look at the way that the Nigerian police force and every other Nigerian security agency is set up, does Nigeria currently have that level of infrastructure? that can actually and genuinely fight the level of organized crime we're talking about here? Well, we need to identify the fact that uh, no nation has sufficiently arrived in terms of tackling organized crime. And the reason is very simple. It is called organized crime. So people plan for it, they prepare for it, they even create scenario about how they are going to go about it, whether it is human trafficking, whether it is gun trafficking, because it's a clandestine operation um, that is sometimes always far ahead of even the law enforcement organizations in terms of the strategies that they deploy. So to the extent to which this is a major challenge to most countries, um, I don't think Nigeria is close to getting the necessary infrastructure to be able to combat organized crime. And the reason is very simple. I'll give you an example which a lot of people are deeply familiar with. Um, look at the Nigeria Niger borderline. It is about 1,500 kilometers. I've done extensive research in the Northeast and the Northwest of Nigeria. And when you talk to custom officials, you talk to the local people, most of these areas are largely porous. In fact, people can easily move from one country and cross to the other with all sorts of contrabands um, through all those informal outlets that have been created over time, um, maybe as a result of historical ties or maybe as a result of sociological connections of people living on both sides of the country. And the call is to modernize custom and border policing, let me put it that way, which we have not seen over time in terms of deploying, deploying drones, in terms of deploying contraband detecting, modern contraband detecting facilities that can actually help to curb the, the free movement of contrabands like hams and everything along that corridor. That is the number one thing. And then in terms of the sophistication of what we even have in combating organized crime, the central idea here is the idea of uh, data management. As we're speaking in Nigeria, um, the National Identity Management Commission is existing. Custom, I mean, um, I want to talk about um, FRSC is capturing people, immigration okay. is capturing people, police is capturing data. All of these things are oddly synchronized in the country. So right. to the extent to which uh, at this point, I'm sorry, I'll have to chime in because we've run out of time for this. We hope that we can have a part two of this conversation to Thank you you so dig much. deeper into this talk. Thank you so much, Mr. Wale Ojewale, for joining us this morning. And thank you, Dr. Kingsley Madriki, for joining us as well.